and with the satanic Bibles and many things, like how does it normally work? A lot of people say, okay, you know, the devil creates some form of division in people's hearts through words, through gossiping, and many other things. But we need to understand that the devil sometimes works in very subtle ways. And those subtle ways in the occult, they say that it normally manifests through self-sufficiency, through independence, and the idea of accomplishing by yourself the things that you normally achieve. And, they, and it creates the idea or the perception that you are omnipotent, that you are capable of doing whatever you want without God's grace. In other words, some version of Pelagianism in, in your own personal life. And then you are just creating and using human diligence without the reliance of God's grace in able for you to understand what God is trying to do in your life. When you realize that there is an evil force at work in your soul, you have to find the tools that will communicate grace to you and repent and find the work of the Holy Spirit to help you uh, regain that freedom. And then every spiritual author goes and quotes uh, Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas. He said, with these evil forces, you do not enter into a kind, respectful dialogue. You don't go to them, would you please leave my soul? Would you please go away? You don't engage in that kind of um, dialogue with a tyrant. You have to use despotic power and command for these forces to leave. And Aristotle explained that from an ethical and moral perspective. And Thomas Aquinas also describes that. And even John of the Cross also is describing that with these evil forces, you don't dialogue. You don't enter into a reasonable argument. You have to command that they leave in the name of God. You have to overthrow the tyrant. And that's the only way you can do that. Why? Because these evil forces, as I said, they are very powerful, but they are very subtle in the way they manage. We see, for example, people who sometimes commit a sin and they become obsessed with this sin. And sometimes people find themselves in isolation. When you feel that you are self-sufficient and independent and that you can achieve things on your own, what happens is it leads you to an isolation. And in that isolation, you become an easy prey. If you go and see these documentaries and um, National Geographic and so on, and you see how lions in the, in the jungle, they go and they, they prey on the, on the very weakened people gazelle. They go to the weakest one and they isolate the victim and when they, and they have isolated the victim, they go and they attack. That's exactly the same thing that happens uh, with the devil. That's why the letter to St. Peter says that the devil is like a lion that is roaring and trying to pray on the ones that are weak. In isolation, that's where we sink. In isolation, that's where we drown. It is the opposite of what God wants to communicate to us in the Eucharist, which is communion. To be in communion with God and in communion with one another, but I have to create within my soul a disposition for communion. Otherwise, I will never be able to understand the beauty, the meaning, and the benefit of it. The third form of darkness is the one that comes from God. I mentioned yesterday the idea of apophaticism. And in apophaticism of negative theology, I said that you talked about the divine names and the attributes of God, and God is this and God is that, but then you have to abandon any preconceived notion that you have of God in order to know the real God. So God can reveal himself to you. How does he do that? Well, we all have a faculty in our souls, which is the intellect. And the intellect, enhanced by the virtue of faith, allows us to understand who God is, so we can respond to his revelation, to his calling, to his appeal of love for all of us. So that's when John the Cross introduces the idea of the dark night of the soul. And I will explain more about that when I talk about purgation uh, 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 this afternoon and tomorrow. But basically, he takes from uh, the pseudo Dionysius the idea of the obfuscation. Pretend that you are in a dark place and that you cannot see anything. Everything is pitch dark. And you're just trying to see, but you cannot see. And all of a sudden, the door is open and you come out. But you're not used to the brightness. You are trying to see, but you cannot see that 
but dark blindness is temporary, is not caused by the absence of light, but rather by the excess of light. That's the obfuscation that he's talking about. There are periods in your life where God is trying to purify whatever idea you, you have of him, and you feel like God is far removed, that God went away, but God is in it. God is, in, God is with you. Your senses are prevented from seeing or feeling God's presence, but it is not because God is absent, it's because God is there and is purifying your perception. Then, in a great classic of English uh, literature that was translated into Spanish in the 16th century, uh, was a great source for St. John of the Cross. And you can read it, uh, go with the uh, modern version because the 14th century version is a little complicated, but it's beautiful. It's called The Cloud of a Knowing. It's a classical of English literature. And John of the Cross read that translation in the 16th century. And in there, John of the Cross was able to understand how this reality happens in the soul. Sometimes we are contemplating the face of God face to face, and we feel validated by God's presence. Why? Because we go to prayer and we get good insights and we have good feelings in our own hearts. And we come out of the chapel feeling filled and feeling validated by God's presence. And then all of a sudden, the God that used to be in front of me is no longer in front of me. He just took a vacation. He just went away. And we don't know where he is. And then there is a deep sadness in the soul. But you still feel that God is around, but you don't feel it. And it's very confusing. And you do not know how to reconcile that feeling. And it creates a great deal of grief in your soul. Until you realize that God, the God that used to be in front of you, is now in you. And you are in Him. And then that is what gives you the awareness of being in union with Him. That is what we call the dark night of the soul. It's a dynamic of God's presence. God's trying to purify so we can love Him, not for what He can give us, but we can love Him for who He is. And in the purification of our love for God, then we can grow and find ourselves in Him. And that's the beauty, the, be the beautiful purgations that happens of the image of God in the soul. In the traditional um, anthropology of uh, Christian spirituality, we talked about the three faculties of the soul since St. Augustine in the fourth century. We talked about the memory and the will and the intellect. And I will explain a little bit of the purgation of, of all of them uh, later today. But a very important thing is that John of the Cross says that of these three powers of the soul, the memory is the faculty that the devil prefers. Because the memory is not just the capacity to remember things, but it's the capacity to remember who you are in the eyes of God and where you are supposed to go. And the Gospel of John, chapter 8, verse 44, says that Satan is the father of lies. And St. John of the Cross quotes that uh, passage from the Gospel and said he loves to create lies in your own memory, messes everything up about your own identity, and when you do not know who you are, then you enter into an existential and the spiritual confusion where you do not know what it is. And what happens is you start fomenting in your soul the sin of idolatry. If you have no God in you, the only thing that you have, if you feel so self-sufficient, so independent, so capable of doing things on your own, and you by default become your own God, then there is no God. What happens is, you take your own ego, you inflate it, and then you project it, and you pray to that. And that's your idea of God. And that God is never going to confront you. Always going to uh, affirm what you think and what you feel. That God <coughs> is never going to let you know uh, that things are not going wrong for you. Because it is basically, it becomes a mechanism of self-affirmation, but it's not faith. In that case, when we foment this kind of idolatry in our own spirituality, then every project, every ministerial action, every sacrament that we celebrate, every harmony that we preach, 
becomes a ritual of self-promotion, a ritual of self-affirmation. We create our own narcissistic religion because we're not talking and praying to the real God. We're talking to the distorted idea of Him, which is just a mere projection of who we are. In that case, every prayer becomes just self-talk. Every meditation is just introspection and self-reflection. This God is never going to confront or dislike anything that you do because it's going to basically validate everything that comes to you. That's the reason why it is important in the Carmelite spirituality to purify our idea of God. And I could tell you, go to your psychologist, your spiritual director, whatever that is, and try to find out who you are. But I said, if you do not know who God is, it doesn't matter what you do. You're never going to know who you are. Because He is the one who created us. He is the one who sent His Son to save us. He's the one who loves us. He is the one who knows us the most. So this is not just a journey to your own self. It is a journey to God, and from God we can actually know the world and ourselves. That's the big difference. In Carmelite spirituality, he introduces the idea of mystical theology. And mystical theology is that we are contemplating the face of God. And we are in union with God. And to that point, that we can see ourselves through the eyes of God. We can see the world through the eyes of God. And people then stop being an annoyance. And your life becomes so, it stops being so uh, conflicted. Because now you can see yourself in the way God sees you. You know, in the 16th century, St. Teresa of Avila had this very disgruntled nun. And this woman, it was just gossiping, it was just basically sabotaging everything that happens in the, in the convent. And then they had to dismiss her. And she felt so rejected by that, because people did not take uh, her own situation. And, and then she went and told the Inquisition, that nuns were having orgies in the convent. <laughs> that they were doing this and doing that, and then went and argued that all sorts of lies just to discredit the centuries of Avila. And then the other nuns came to the mother and said, what are you going to do? Now the Inquisition is involved. And the of Avila said, tell the Inquisition that I can be, I can be harder on myself than they can. <laughs> Rejection, triggers, a great deal of darkness in people's souls. Some people can go with sadness, but some people can go with retaliation. If you have somebody who has an unresolved issue with abandonment and rejection, and for some reason you tap into it, be careful where this is going to go. Learn that in yourself so you can learn how to identify it from somebody else and how to treat it with the gentleness and kindness of God's grace. When I was vicar general in my diocese, there was this priest, wonderful, wonderful priest, 